welcome to the program. Very good to be here. So is this as big a mess as we all think? Certainly people around the world still can't get their heads around what Brexit means and whether an election will sort it out. Well, it's a big mess because Brexit is tearing up Britain's economic and security and environmental and social arrangements of the last 50 years and not being clear about what you're replacing it with. I think you could argue that all the parliamentary votes that people around the world might have seen are really a way of the country pausing to think about whether this is the right step. So you could argue in a very British way that the checks and balances have worked and this election is in a sense forcing the country to confront the issue again. When we talk about the economy, I just said, and you obviously know, that the, the pro-Boris Johnson paper, um, the Daily Telegraph, which is really a Tory-backing paper, had to retract and correct all sorts of big flamboyant promises and predictions he made. I mean, we're going to be the strongest economy in the Western Hemisphere. What do you think? Where, I mean, you're the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Where is the economy and what, where do those promises sort of land? Well, there's no doubt that the British economy would be stronger if the country hadn't voted to leave. Because hadn't voted, but had, he's saying it will be. If it yes, I mean, if the country hadn't voted out. to leave, our GDP would be higher, the value of the currency would be higher, uh, and the the act of that vote has cast a pall over the UK, and mm. investment has somewhat stalled. Now, of course, it depends a lot how you leave the EU. And it depends how close you are with the EU once you've left. Is it, you know, just a political exit, but you stay closely aligned economically, in which case the damage will be much less than a really sharp departure from our nearest trading partners. And at the moment, the world, the international investing community, people who bet on the British currency, people who buy property in this country, they're all waiting to see because we haven't fundamentally resolved that question three and a half years after that vote. And actually, in these three and a half years, all those stakeholders that you're just talking about have voted basically no, because there isn't as much investment, there isn't as much property being bought. The currency, as, you've said, as you said, has fallen. Um, what might turn it around? Well, I think people want some certainty, and then you can make some clearer decisions going forward. I mean, the, the, the currency dropped a lot three years ago, and that absorbed a lot of the shock of yeah. the, the result of that referendum. I think now people want to know, well, what is the long-term relationship with our big near neighbours like France and Germany and Belgium and the like? And if the view is it's going to be a distant one, it's going to be the same relationship that we have, let's say, with Brazil or Thailand or you know, important countries, but not ones that we're very close to, then I think the people around the world who invest in the UK will mark the UK down again. If we remain very close and these things are still up for grabs, in British politics, such as being in the customs union, being in the single market, then you're still in the economic arrangements of the EU and, and, and people will mark the UK up. If the country votes to stay in, and that we can come on to that, that, that may well be an option in the next few months, uh, then, of course, the country would be marked up again because people would have confidence that Britain's uh, economic competitiveness and, and close trading relationship with our neighbours would remain. So... I mean, what do you think this election will resolve? I mean, wh wh I mean, you, you know, you're a former Tory Chancellor of the Exchequer. You've been an MP for a long time. You're no longer. Now you're listening to the voice of the people more, I guess, as an editor-in-chief of the, of the Evening Standard. So you're hearing a lot, perhaps more than you did when you were in Cabinet and in, in office. What do you think the result is going to look like? Well, the truth is, I don't know. And if, if I don't know, that's because lots of people who follow politics very closely, been involved like I have, you know, think this is a very, very uncertain election. And what that means is it's a big gamble. Boris Johnson has taken a very big gamble. Some say he had no choice because he was essentially in a situation where he couldn't govern. In our system, you need a majority in Parliament. He didn't have that majority. But it's a big risk. And, you know, people assuming that he will walk it uh, I think are making, you know, a very generous assumption. He's a good campaigner, he's a good politician, you know, he's charismatic, but at the same time, the Conservative Party that he leads is repelling a lot of urban, professional, younger voters, uh, voters from ethnic minorities, uh, voters in cities like London, uh, who, you know, frankly, want a more open, internationalist, socially liberal Conservative movement. And, you know, they're not getting that at the moment. In a way, Brexit divided the country that was already, like many political 
systems divided on economic class, on a kind of cultural yeah. axis as well, uh, between a sort of open and closed world. And it's not unlike, of course, what has happened in the United States, you know, where you've found the, the centre-right party, the Republican Party, ending up representing former industrial towns that used to be Democrat, and the Democrats representing you know, progressive, uh, forward-looking, well, you know, economically more active places that used to be Republican. So you're getting a similar kind of segmentation going on here and, and a big churn, and people don't know how that's going to play out in terms of the actual seats won in this And process. people are getting very nervous about what the politicians are promising them, as they always are, but in this case, for instance, Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers essentially staked everything just about on these great new bilateral deals that they would make after Brexit, including, number one, with the United States of America. Well, this weekend, Donald Trump, the president, had a phone call with Nigel Farage, the Brexit party leader, the man who brought us Brexit, essentially, who now has a radio program, and he poured cold water over that issue. I'm just going to play it, and then we can talk about it. We're far and away the largest economy in the world, and we want to do trade with UK, and they want to do trade with us. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, this deal, under certain aspects of the deal, uh, you can't do it. You can't no. do it. You, you can't trade. Well, I mean, we can't make a trade deal with the UK, and we can be, because I, I, I think you, we can do many times the numbers that we're doing right now. I mean, that raises so many questions. Well, we've got to start with, that's a radio phone-in program. Right. And the President of the United States has called in to take part in a discussion about British politics. I mean, I, I remember when Barack Obama came to Downing Street yeah. and I was there. On and, your behalf. And he, there was a discussion about whether he should say anything about Brexit. He, he did say something about Britain being at the back of the queue for trade deals. There was outrage that an American president had expressed any kind of opinion on British politics. And here you have uh, President Trump phoning in on a radio talk show and sounding off about who he thinks should lead the country and what the nature of trade deals will be going forward. Um, whether he, you know, he suggested there that uh, Nigel Farage, late, later in that, yeah. Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson should get together. I mean, it, it, like, like the rest of the world, I guess, and like the citizens of the United States, we're getting used to a president who does not abide by any of the rules that we got used to. Yeah, but, I, I mean, I, I got from that, I translated from that, Britain would, all, would be at the back of the queue again. I mean, he did not sound like, like, you know, what Boris Johnson has told the British public will happen, that we're going to be at the front of the queue, we're going to get a great trade deal, and it's going to be quick. Well, None of that was said. I think there will, it will be many, many years, if ever, before there is a trade deal with the United States. Beca not because we don't have a lot of cultural and economic affinity with the United States, not because we don't do a lot of business with the United States mm -hmm. already. It's just that the mechanics of a trade deal beg the question, what are we going to buy from the United States that we don't currently buy? And then you get into all sorts of controversial questions in this country about agricultural produce, hormone-injected beef, mm -hmm. and critically in this election, whether our public health care system, the National Health, care, health Service, the NHS, is going to be open to... US companies bidding for pharma contracts and the like. And that has proved to be a, a, a chink, a door, a little light door through which the Labour Party, led by an unreconstructed Marxist, which, by the way, is also part of the election mess here, has started to push through and, 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 and raise concerns amongst the British people. So that, about is, that. that is really interesting, because you're talking about Jeremy Corbyn, um, and, and people are equally nervous about him, including yeah. his view on uh, Brexit, not to mention the anti-Semitism um, around the party that have caused many Labour politicians to leave the party, and, of course, many Conservative Tory politicians have left the party. So just, just quickly on the health issue. We saw in the midterms in the United States that the winning issue was health yeah. to a great extent. Not the fear-mongering politics, not personality politics, but it was health. Do you, think, do you think that could be the same here in Britain? I mean, could Labour run a successful campaign based on an issue like health, like the National Health mm. Service, that is so dear to so many people? Well, a general election is not a referendum. It's not a yes-no question. Mm -hmm. And Boris Johnson and the Conservatives want this just to be about Brexit. But, of course, it's about many other things, including the National Health Service, which is always a big election issue in Britain. And it's also not just a simple contest between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, who both, 
you know, appeal to some voters but repel others. There are other participants in this election, minor parties like the Liberal Democrats and the Scottish Nationalists, who are expected to do well. And that's why this result is so difficult to predict, because there are so many moving parts. You could, could get a, a, you know, I think the sort of central expectation is that Boris Johnson probably wins with a small majority and, uh, and stays in office, although it doesn't necessarily resolve Brexit. But there are many other outcomes where he can't form a government and there's a kind of rainbow alliance in which Jeremy Corbyn, you know, who would be the first Marxist prime minister Britain's ever had, finds himself in office supported by other parties. So it's, it's, a, it's a real kaleidoscope. And, and right in the heart of all this are a lot of politically homeless people, millions yeah. of people, moderate people on the left who don't want a Marxist, uh, liberal Tories who, who want a socially progressive, internationalist, pro-European conservative movement and haven't got one. And where those politically homeless people go, whether they're scared back into their camps, if you like, or pushed back into their camps, or whether they find a new home, is one of the really interesting features of this election. The latest grandee to leave your party, the Tory party, is one of your predecessors, Philip Hammond, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he was kicked out. And he, uh, he has said he's not even going to contest his seat in the next election because he, in conscious ca conscience, cannot run as a Conservative, nor does he want to run against a Conservative as an Independent. Um, just talk to me a little bit, because, you know, your government, David Cameron, who brought the referendum that everybody thinks was the worst decision in modern British politics, and you were the Chancellor of the che Exchequer, I know you didn't... Tell me, you didn't agree with having a referendum. I was against having a referendum, but... Right. But you had I was referendum. part of the government that, that uh, yeah. held that referendum. Could you, in retrospect, could you have, I don't know, worked harder to make sure that referendum didn't happen? I, you know, I think about that all the time. Uh, I don't think it would have made any difference if I had resigned. I was against having one. No, no, stop uh, them from having the referendum. You know, I know. I mean, the, the Conservative movement had got it into its head that the best thing to do was to ask the people about Europe, partly because it was itself divided and didn't have... Mm an answer. Um, I think the much more, you know, that, of course, has been very damaging. But the departure today of Philip Hammond, who was my successor as Chancellor. And a former foreign minister. Uh, Ken, former foreign minister. Uh, Ken Clark, who was uh, a, a minister under Margaret Thatcher, also Chancellor Exchequer. These two, you know, big figures in the Tory movement in this country have been pushed out. Uh, and it's pretty extraordinary that, you know, if the Conservative Party abandons that centrist tradition, then it's really, I think, uh, con mm -hmm. confining itself to the political margins and will pay an electoral price, probably in part of this election, but certainly in the future. There are many good friends of mine still in the Conservative Party and, and the government, uh, but they need to remember how we used to win. And we used to win by being in the centre, yeah. by being for everyone, for being socially progressive and internationalist. And, and the Conservative movement here is in danger of forgetting that. Yeah, both, as you said, the left and the right have been pushed to the extremes. Um, do you think, and I think the rest of the world wants to know, that there's any chance that Brexit might not happen? Boris Johnson has already failed in his promises to the people. He said, I'll die in a ditch rather than not have it happen 31st of October. Well, it hasn't happened. Will it for sure happen January 31st, which is the next deadline? And could there be another referendum that could that could change the vote. Yes, I think it's, it's, it's fairly likely there could be another referendum. In a way, because the political system, again, can't agree on, on Europe and we revisit the reasons why we had a mm -hmm. referendum in the first place. Uh, so we've had many missed deadlines, many absolute do-or-die promises that they wouldn't be missed. Uh, and we're now heading into an election where if there's any outcome other than a clear majority for Boris Johnson, I think we're into a second referendum uh, early in the new year. And now, and that's going to be close as well, because the country hasn't hugely changed from the country it was three and a half years ago. But that contest was close. And in this contest, perhaps with more young people taking part in the contest, uh, you could see the result go the other way. In the United States, you've seen how many, many members of the President's Party, the Republican Party, are just simply retiring, not running in 2020, either for, you know, either House of Congress. Here, we've seen uh, an alarming number of people, mostly women, um, deciding not to contest their seats, not to run in this next election, stepping down, uh, because of the toxic environment. I mean, it just seems there is a toxic political environment. Certainly here, on the Brexit issue, there's been a lot of verbal abuse, a lot of, you know, MPs are, you know, misogynistic, sexist, and, and, and very ugly stuff, and have had to have protection, etc. I mean, what, what can you say 
about that? I mean, do you think that's going to change anytime soon, even with the new election? That well, toxicity? Look, look, the country's very divided. British politics has always been very robust, as anyone who's ever seen Prime Minister's questions on television will know. But it's got much more toxic. Social media has fueled that. I think we don't know yet whether this is a sort of passing phase as social media disrupts politics around the world and then people kind of adjust to the new communication medium, just as they had to in the past adjust to the television and the radio and the printing press hundreds of years ago. You know, or this is actually a more permanent state of affairs. I'm more optimistic that mainstream forces, moderate forces, will h harness this new technology and find a way to promote their causes. At the moment, however, that's a hope rather than, you know, I can't point to hard evidence of it. Uh, and hopefully, you know, it, it becomes an environment in which women feel much more uh, comfortable going into politics and remaining in politics. Good news is there are actually quite a few good women standing now, new women standing for parliament, and, and I hope they get elected. You just talked about evidence. One of the, I don't know whether you saw this poll this week, it was done for Bristol University, which said that the majority of, of, of a group of leavers who they decided to, to talk to simply do not believe the experts on the economy. So you started by saying the evidence shows that the economy will be significantly mm -hmm. worse after Brexit or in a Brexit um, situation. And leavers don't believe it. They don't believe the experts. And you remember during the campaign, one of the main Brexiteers said, people have had enough of experts. Mm. That seems to have trickled down and stuck with the leavers. How worrying is that, that people don't... And again, we see that in the United States as well. On many issues, depending on what part of the political spectrum you are, you just don't believe the facts and you think they're just politicised. You know, I think that's been a, a general feature. I think, again, it's it's social media. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, in, a, in an age when everyone watched network television, you know, and the whole nation gathered around a television set, you know, then there were sort of trusted reporters who told you the facts. Yeah. You know, that was easier to control. Now people get their news from many different sources. But I would say there's a bit of a fight back coming. It's an interesting, for example, today, the Conservatives doctored a breakfast television interview from one of the uh, Labour spokesmen, they've been called out on it. And, you know, they're having to retreat later today. The Labour Party has found itself in similar trouble. Early on in this election contest, there seems to be a more aggressive fact-checking going on by our domestic broadcasters. And that's already, to, from what I can see, beginning to uh, temper the behaviour of the politicians and make it more difficult for them just to, it, it, you know, ignore the noise and, and go on repeating their message. And as a former chancellor and, you know, somebody who's right in the heart of power, do you think this country is doing a good enough job of protecting, protecting itself from the kind of foreign interference that did happen during Brexit and obviously happened in the 2016 US election? Well, there is, a, at the moment, a suppressed report. Uh, suppressed because it was due to be published before the parliament broke for the election, and it hasn't been on Russian interference in the uh, referendum campaign in uh, 2016 in the UK. Be familiar to US listeners and viewers. It was ne clearly not on the scale that the US experienced. Um, but you have to ask yourself the basic question, which is, why would the Russian government want a leave vote in a referendum? You know, the simple reason, because they want to break up the ties of the West. They want and weaken to, Britain. They break up the alliances that holds Britain to the European Union, as well as to our key allies like the United States. And, you know, they want, you know, our opponents want disruption. And uh, it, whether or not it made any difference, personally, I suspect it probably didn't affect the outcome. Nevertheless, you have to ask yourself, why was the motive there? And that's a clue uh, to the course that the country has embarked upon, but may yet uh, change. It's, it's really interesting. So much at stake. George Osborne, former Chancellor, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.